What is the importance of beauty? Why do we innately desire to make ourselves attractive to each other? Well, beauty, I have a chapter in my book, Beyond Order, called Make One Room in Your House as Beautiful as Possible, which is an elaboration of the idea of cleaning your room, and which is something I've become famous for saying, I suppose, or infamous, or parodied, Mothers, ar mothers around the world love you for yeah, that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, well, Dostoevsky said, beauty will save the world. And Dostoev or Solzhenitsyn, another great... Russian author, wrote a remarkable essay on beauty as a consequence of that statement. And, and interestingly enough, just this week, I have a translation team working in Russia, translating my videos, some of them, and also my book. And they were talking to me about that book and said that they're translators who are, there's many of them, and a team, and they're doing a very good job, as far as I can tell, really liked that chapter. They thought it was the best chapter. And I thought that was great, because I think that's the best chapter in both books. So You do? So, yes, I do. I did a chapter on beauty. I was most happy with that. Hmm. And beauty, the thing about beauty is that it, it calls to you outside of that faculty of rational criticism. So I'll tell you a story. I had this client. He was a real brilliant architect, a um, great artist as well, mm -hmm. and a really creative guy. And... But he had an incredibly critical intellect, and it was always after everything, so he was atheistic and very rationalistic, and he couldn't figure out how to not believe that life was meaningless and pointless, and when, that, when those critical ideas would occupy the theater of his imagination, it would just take him out. He would become depressed and nihilistic and unable to work, but if he could not think that and concentrate on his art, then he was alive. And you might say, well, he's just ignoring those criticisms. It's like, no, no, that, that's not right. Because there are experiences that we have, thankfully, that are outside the domain of rational criticism. And we need to attend to them because the critical intellect, which helps you discriminate, is a wonderful thing. But it's an authoritarian devil that's cynical beyond belief and that undermines everything. And we all fall prey to that. And it's particularly true of people who are, you know, may be exceptional in their verbal intelligence. It's a gift, but also a curse, because it saws the branches that they sit on off all right. the time. You fall. <laughs> yeah, well, but then you think about, think about music and, and beautiful music and the way it grips you, you know, and so you're listening to music and you don't, the critical mind could pop up and say, well, what are you doing? This is just noises. It doesn't have any significance. But the wiser part of you says, you're out of your depth. Shut up. Listen to the music and, and, and experience what happens. And what music is the harmonious interplay of patterns, and you fall into that pattern harmoniously if you're listening to music, and that sets you right with the world. And that's a real thing. It's real. It's more real, hopefully, than anything else. Maybe it's even more real than suffering. That's what we could all pray for, that right. that capacity to be engrossed in beauty and meaning is more powerful than, perhaps more powerful than death itself. And so, and you, you, you have to watch yourself to decide if that's true, rather so than thinking about it. Just notice what happens when you're engrossed in something, and beauty calls you to a higher mode of being. And, and it does that underneath rationality, and that's partly why Dostoevsky said beauty will save the world, and Solzhenitsyn commented on it. It's like, it's the antidote to rational cynicism. It's part of the, there's more, but it's part of the antidote. And it's more powerful than rational cynicism, experientially, in an embodied manner. And so beauty, beauty calls to you with, it's a representation of the essential goodness of the world, and it calls to you to be more than you are, to adopt a mode of being that's engrossed in, in meaning, and, and, uh, and an orientation towards the good, and you know, when, when the fathers of the Christian church were trying to understand God, conceptualize God, one conceptualization, conceptualization is the sun and bonum, the sum of all good. When you say, does that exist? Well, it's, that's not the issue here. What's the highest value? It's the sum of all good. It's the integration, say, of beauty and truth and justice and all these partial goods. And so beauty is a window into that highest good. It's a pointer to it. Mm -hmm. And so, of course it's vital, because what could possibly be more vital than a pointer that is immune to rational criticism to the higher good? 
How could anything be more important than that, except the higher good itself? And so there's a, a divine aspect to beauty, and that's true whether you're an atheist or not, because the divine element is the depth of the experience, right? And that's of religious significance. And this is independent of propositional beliefs. Well, does beauty, do you believe in God? No. Does beauty have an embodied effect on you, an emotional effect, a motivational effect? Yes. Okay, well, forget about your criticism. Just focus on that. There's, there's something to that that's not trivial. It's certainly not secondary, like who cares if things are beautiful. It's like, no, no, no. No, no. We care. That thing. And then we could talk, talk about this economically as well, too. You know, one of the things that's so absolutely stunning about Europe, it's not limited to Europe, but it is absolutely stunning, is there's so much beauty there that human beings created, especially architecturally, but not only architecturally, in the, in the domain of pure art as well. And then you think about all the people around the world making pilgrimages to Europe to see that beauty, because that's what it is. They think they're tourists. They think they're out to be, I don't know, rejuvenated, revivified. It's a holiday. It's entertainment. No, no, it's a spiritual journey. And, and they're called by the beauty. Even they, the cathedrals themselves, for example, are so stunningly beautiful that they can sustain themselves in some sense, even in the face of that onslaught of rational criticism, just because of what they implicitly represent as creations in and of themselves, and they are pointers to the divine. There's absolutely no doubt about that. So, so back to your patient for one second. Did it yes. help him to have this insight? Oh, definitely. Absolutely. You know, we, 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 di we differentiated between these. Look, you've got this rational demon in your mind, essentially, an autonomous spirit in some sense that is useful and powerful, but unbelievably critical. Yeah. It's not your friend, not all the time. When is it that you can tolerate your life best? Because he was suffering a lot. He had very severe depression. He was really suffering. And so it was, it was, and I, it was a process. It was the process whereby he consulted himself. I wasn't trying to convince him of something. It was an investigation. It's like, watch yourself for two weeks. When are things better and when are they worse? Well, they're better when I'm making representations of the community that he was making a model of this little town he lived in and, and investigating its Art, history. beauty. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And he was very good at that sort of thing. And he was very engrossed in that, although then he'd think about it. I said, well, why am I doing this stupid thing? So like, to make, really take it to the next step, though, why is it important for us to look our best? Why do we focus on it so much? I mean, the amount of effort that women in particular, but even more men these days as well, to spend to make sure they look their best. And much of this imagery is, is uh, in a way reflecting what we would look like if we were fertile and vibrant mm -hmm, and young, right? Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. rosy cheeks, your lips that are uh, reddish, mm -hmm. again, it's blood going there because you're interested, uh, the big eyes, again, mm -hmm. excitement, mm -hmm. uh, eyelashes accentuate that. All these uh, elements of the modern world are not just coincidences. People are hardwired. Now, as a physician, I always thought that external beauty was a barometer of internal health. Mm -hmm. And in fairness, the quality of your skin is a pretty good reflection mm -hmm. of how healthy you as are. Is, as is your symmetry. As your symmetry is another good example. And you know, what was it like for you in utero? I mean, was everything working correctly on the outside? Because that means probably everything's working correctly on the inside. But you're saying there's even more to that. Then maybe we actually, repre by representing the best we can be on the outside, we're perhaps focusing on that same on the inside. Well, we're practicing that at least to some degree, right? To put yourself together. I mean, women will say that I have to go put myself together and they mean to adjust their appearance. And some of that, if that can be manipulative. It can be overstated. Um, it can be a, bur a burden that women have to carry. There's no doubt about that. But there's all these other things happening as well. And some of it's in some sense, extremely brutal because, as you said, markers of sexual beauty in particular do tend to be associated with health and youth. And so if you're not healthy and you're not young, that's reflected in your appearance. It's pretty hard on you, you yeah. know. And so it's no wonder people object to that, you know, as the primary marker of someone's significance. But we are biological creatures as well. But there is something underneath that as well. It's like... Some of it is the reflection of the ideal human form, you know, celebrated in sculpture and in art across the centuries, and a call to approximate that to the degree that it's possible in your own life, and a call to health, and a call to physical fitness, and a call to, well, trying to understand what it is that's attractive. You know, I, I mean, I, why do women reject men? 
Well, because they're not Jesus Christ. Really, that's why. I mean, that's a crazy thing to say, but women have a lot at stake when they're trying to pick a mate because they want someone who will stick by them and be good, as good as possible for them and their children. They need someone who's really together to do that properly. And so they reject men who don't approximate that ideal. Well, is it Jesus Christ? It's like, well, you can replace that with whatever ideal you might see fit, but it's the same issue. And so we are trying to approximate an ideal, and there is some of that. So in Revelation, Christ comes back as a judge. He's very merciful in most cases in the Gospels. He comes back as a judge. And part of that, that, that ideal, and every ideal is a judge, right? Every ideal is a judge. So you say, well, no judges, okay, no ideals. Well, okay, well, no ideals, well, no direction, no meaning. You, you throw out the judge, you throw out the meaning. Yeah. Well, you throw out the positive meaning because you're still going to be left with pain and suffering and terror. Yeah. That's a terrible thing, you know, to, to understand that judgment is associated with value. But of course, you have to discriminate between what's highest and lowest. And you do that all the time when you act. It's built right into the act of perception. And it's a precondition for action. There's no escaping judgment. 